Hello, everyone, uh, and welcome. I want to thank you for joining us tonight for a webinar about living with mild to moderate psoriasis, what you need to know. My name is Antonella Scali, and I'm the Executive Director of the Canadian Psoriasis Network, or CPN. For those of you who are new to us, CPN is a nonprofit organization dedicated to improving the lives of people and families in Canada affected by psoriasis and psoriatic arthritis. We do this by providing current information on research and treatment and working with others to build awareness and advocacy about the complexities of psoriatic disease. We're very pleased that you can join us tonight. Uh, several of our board members um, are people who live with psoriasis, uh, including our founding member. And though they share a common story of suffering with symptoms of psoriasis, they share a greater one of hope and of taking control of their disease. And this is what motivates CPN and why we're pleased to put on educational sessions like this one to help connect people with information and with each other. We are again very pleased that you can join us especially tonight on the 15th annual World Psoriasis Day. This awareness day was started to recognize the millions of people worldwide who live with this condition, including the approximately 2% of people in Canada. And, and of course, their families uh, who are affected by uh, psoriasis as well. And of these people, up to one in three will develop psoriatic arthritis. So we chose to do a webinar today because World Psoriasis Day is all about building connections, creating awareness, and challenging stigma about psoriasis. As we know, many people with psoriasis live quote unquote normal lives or occasionally struggle with flare ups or may consider symptoms um, a nuisance. But for many others, psoriasis can be a regular struggle with symptoms disrupting many aspects of their lives, including sleep, work, family life, emotional well-being, and even finances. Finding a treatment that works, being able to access it, and possibly having to adjust or change it because of things like one's body developing a tolerance to a particular treatment are all part of the reality for many people living with this condition. And stigma also exists. Though we're all working very hard to challenge some, hard, some of the harder held beliefs, um, we, for instance, we are strong believers here at CPN in the idea that psoriasis isn't contagious, but awareness is. We also work to build awareness around the fact that psoriasis is not, quote unquote, just a skin disease. Not only is it related to an increased risk of, of certain other associated conditions like psoriatic arthritis, but living with psoriasis can be overwhelming at times for many people, as mentioned. This webinar is focusing primarily on the countless people who live with mild to moderate symptoms. Uh, though their disease may not have full body involvement or may not be as visible, for whom the challenges that I noted can still be significant. For instance, the degree of psychosocial impact of psoriasis on a person's life, that is how they feel about themselves and how this disease affects their personal relationships and social experiences, is not necessarily directly related to the severity of the disease. For instance, people with even a mild form of psoriasis may experience things like social withdrawal, anxiety, or even depression. The emotional impact of psoriasis on a person's life doesn't depend solely on the severity of symptoms, but on how each person feels about things like the itchiness, the pain, and the discomfort of psoriasis, as well as the visibility of plaques. For tonight's presentation, we are very grateful to first hear from two speakers, Laura Catalano and Sandra Clark, who both live with mild to moderate psoriasis to learn more what it's like to, li to live with this from a personal level and to remind those of you who may be able to relate to some of what we hear that you're not alone. To provide a presentation on psoriasis and a deeper dive into living with mild to moderate symptoms, including a refresher and update on treatment, we're also honored to welcome Dr. Irina Turchin, a community dermatologist in Fredericton, New Brunswick. We're very pleased that all three of you could join us. And before we get started, there are a few things I would like to mention just for all the participants on the line. Um, all, uh, we'll, we'll, every participant in the audience for today's webinar will be in listen-only mode for the duration of the session. There will be a question and answer portion at the end of the presentation, so please feel free to jot anything down or um, type into the, um, the, the chat box, you'll see at the right hand side of your screen an option to type in a question under the word chat. And please, um, we'll do our best to answer the questions at, in the last segment. 
Uh, but if there are any questions that don't get an immediate answer or that we're not able to get to tonight, um, because we are uh, finishing up in an hour, we'll do our best to um, respond to you directly uh, and have further discussion with you after the webinar. And just um, for, for your information, this session will be recorded and will be available for viewing on CPN's website and YouTube channel. And we'll also have it transcribed into French so that you can share it with your broader network uh, in both languages. So with no further ado, I'd like to introduce our first speaker, Laura Catalano. Laura is a CPN member and patient advocate from Montreal who's lived with psoriasis for almost 40 years. She shares her story and experiences to build connection and hope among others who may experience challenges, who may experience challenges with this condition. Thank you, Laura. I'm very pleased to hand it over to you. Thank you, Antonella. Hi, everyone. Um, as Antonella mentioned, I have been living with plague psoriasis since the age of five, which is almost 40 years now. It is mainly on my scalp, arms, and legs. My knees and elbows are the most stubborn, and my legs have some scaly patches. It used to be itchy when I was very young, but now it no longer bothers me. Growing up with psoriasis wasn't easy emotionally and physically, especially being in grade school. At such a young age, I didn't really understand what I had. And back in the day, I was a child labeled with a skin disease. I was constantly feeling embarrassed because of my skin and hiding behind clothes, even on the hottest summer days. No one understood what psoriasis was and almost automatically thought it was a contagious skin disease. I wasn't allowed to go swimming with my classmates and I remember my parents frantically taking me to many doctor appointments and getting notes that I was okay to swim and interact with others. I did have moments of why me and I remember crying with my mom because I was different. Despite it all, I was lucky to have a great family support system and even at such a young age, I had friends who never really questioned what was on my skin and were accepting of me. As I entered my teen years, I started having more self-confidence and realized that psoriasis would not define me. After numerous doctor's appointments and trying to get as much information on the disorder, I started to focus less on my skin and accept who I was. I knew true friends would never judge me, and in some way, I ignored how psoriasis made me feel. Over the years, I tried many types of medication. I remember my mother putting greasy ointment and wrapping my arms and legs with saran wrap. I also had smelly tar on my body and scalp. I think I tried almost all lotions from shampoos, salicylic acid, and cortisone types. Out of desperation to have clear skin, I even purchased products from infomercials. My parents even took me to Italy to find a cure. As a result, some of the treatments made it worse. Others worked for a while, but once the skin got the psoriasis back. I did finally find a treatment that works for me, and it's phototherapy. I am lucky to have easy access to a dermatologist who has the lamps, and I try to go three times a week. I also apply topical creams in conjunction with the phototherapy, but only on patches as needed. So far, my psoriasis has cleared up by 90%. However, I still have it on my scalp and I just choose to live with it. I know what type of hair products irritate my skin and I just avoid them. In 2016, I also had an acute episode of psoriatic arthritis. Ever since, it has acted up, but not as badly, and I became more aware of my triggers such as stress, and I basically try to manage it before it gets out of hand. However, I can't control the weather, so there are times that my joints will swell and I have some stiffness. This is my reality, and I try my hardest not to make it ruin my day when times are rougher. For anyone living with mild to moderate psoriasis, you need to know that psoriasis treatment is not a one-fits-all solution. You need to look at different treatment options, listen to your body, and see what might work for you. Don't bring yourself down, and don't surround yourself with people who look at you and see only your skin. Accepting who we are and getting educated so that we, in turn, can educate others makes a big difference. I only wish that my family had a better understanding that psoriasis is an autoimmune disorder and not a skin disease. Having a good relationship with your dermatologist is equally important. If your doctor does not take the time to listen to you and quickly prescribes your treatment without explaining the effects and your options, 
then I would question them or try to get a second opinion. It's important that your doctor monitors your progress and can provide you with additional insight on newer treatments that are out there. Lastly, what has helped me cope is joining groups on social media or connecting with others who live with psoriasis because it brings me comfort in knowing that I am not alone. I am not ashamed of my skin and every opportunity I get, I try to educate others on what psoriasis is and what it's not. Thank you. Thank you so much, Laura, for giving us a whole uh, history uh, in a few minutes. And I think you touched on so many uh, things that we hear uh, about from, from the broader community. So uh, I look forward to hearing some of what Dr. Uh, Turchin's presentation touches on uh, in terms of some of what you talked about. So thank you very much. And, and uh, any questions for Laura, um, again, we can touch on at the end. Um, now I would like to introduce Sandra Clark. Uh, Sandra is our second speaker uh, who's lived with psoriasis for almost 30 years and is a current patient of Dr. Turchin. So she shares her story and experiences to highlight the value of being informed about psoriasis throughout the course of one's condition and, and to also build hope for people. Thank you so much, Sandra. Thank you. Hi, my name is Sandra and I have lived with psoriasis for about 30 years. Learning to live with psoriasis has been a process and psoriasis has changed me and altered my life. In my early 20s, I started getting red, scaly, raised spots, starting on my elbows and my knees. It was then that I became self-conscious about my skin and psoriasis began to impact every decision that I made every day. What to, uh, what to wear, how I saw myself, what kind of clothes to shop for, going from store to store, searching for shirts that go below my elbows and shorts that go below my knees. Colors mattered when I got psoriasis in my scalp, always buying light clothes so people could not see the flakes. Saving my legs was painful, and what to do on vacation, I hated going to the beach. I was embarrassed by my appearance. I was embarrassed by the flaking I left behind. I've had so many people ask me if I was contagious. Flaking is embarrassing, and I would rather stay home than go out. When I was diagnosed with psoriasis, I had no idea what it was, and I knew no one that had it. Today, there is more information in the media about psoriasis, but many people still do not know what it is. Stress would flare my psoriasis up, but I could not figure out how to avoid stress in a stressful world. If I could step back, I would have sought counseling for stress sooner in my life. I married late in my life because of my low self-esteem and isolation. I met my husband on a blind date. Shopping for a wedding dress was very difficult and expensive. Needing sleeves and were long enough to cover my elbows. I've been on many different treatments, uh, but never could find something that would work for a long, long time. In my 40s, Dr. Turgeon invited me to learn uh, to a learning session on psoriasis. This was the first time I met, I had sat in a room with others with different degrees of psoriasis and learned their story. I learned so much in these sessions that I wish I had known earlier in my life. It was good, it was a good eye opener on how diabetes, cardiovascular disease, and obesity can, re can be related to psoriasis. Knowing this information earlier in my life may have changed choices that I have, have made. I think there is a need for more information sessions and counseling for people with mild and moderate symptoms of psoriasis. Knowing more about psoriasis does not cure it, but it helps to deal with it. Meeting others in the information sessions and hearing their stories was amazing. Everyone that struggles with psoriasis has a story to tell. Being embarrassed by my appearance was my, my biggest struggle. Helping people with this at a very beginning is important. It helps with depression and obesity. In the last few years, I took control of my life. I have had counseling. I've learned more about psoriasis. I've lost weight. My diabetes is completely normal. And I have no more high blood pressure. I still have psoriasis and always will, but I have 
taking control instead of letting psoriasis control me. I have learned that staying healthy is important, especially if you have psoriasis. I have realized that whatever changes I have made, it must be for the rest of my life. In doing that, I need to set goals that I know that I can do for the rest of my life. It is important to let Dr. Persian know any changes in my skin, cracks, sores. I have not always kept a journal, but when I have, it has helped to know what treatments I've had, triggers that cause it. Food journaling was important to see what food I was allergic to. Knowledge about psoriasis is important, and I am very thankful for the information sessions and hearing other people's stories. Thank you. Thank you, Sandra. I, you again, uh, did a, a, an amazing job in telling your story uh, to capture just the the holistic nature um, of of this condition and and how con connection and and learning from others is such a valuable um, piece of support um, that that we hear about from from a lot of people and and that helps them through um, managing what is a chronic condition. So. Um, Thank you for sharing that. And um, as with Laura, if there are any questions, uh, both Sandra and Laura are kindly going to participate in Q&A. So um, we're happy to, to uh, ask them then. Um, so I will turn it over to uh, Dr. Turgeon. Um, as mentioned, uh, Dr. Turgeon is a community dermatologist in Fredericton, New Brunswick. She is a dermatology consultant for the Horizon Health Network and assistant professor at Dalhousie and Memorial University. She's a clinical investigator with Probity Medical Research. After receiving her medical degree from the University of Calgary, Dr. Turgeon completed dermatology residency training at McGill uh, University in Montreal. She's been practicing general dermatology in New Brunswick since 2009 and has been in clinical research since 2014. She has conducted phase two, three, and four clinical trials investigating treatments for psoriasis, atopic dermatitis, hydriodentis superativa, palmal plantar pustulosis, and actinic keratosis. And in her spare time, which I don't know when that is, <laughs> Dr. Turgeon enjoys spending time with her family, walking her dog, and playing with her grandson, Nolan. We are very honored to have you present um, today, Dr. Turgeon, and thank you for sharing your presentation with us. And I will turn it over to you and this fabulous uh, World Psoriasis Day Awareness photo. Thank you, Antonella. Um, I, I'm very touched by these stories. First of all, I see psoriasis uh, patients every day and every story is different. And uh, we really take it to heart and really help, um, try to help uh, every patient that we see. And these are, uh, this is a photo from today, Happy World Psoriasis Day, we were celebrating today. And with my great staff who really uh, make me the best doctor I could be. And we're gonna move to the next slide. So just uh, briefly, um, I wanted to be a physician all my life. Um, as Antonella mentioned, I uh, did medical school at the uh, University of Calgary. Uh, so I hope some people from Western Canada may be joining us. Uh, I've also graduated of my Guild Dermatology Residency Program, and I've been practicing uh, dermatology now for um, 10 years uh, on my own. Uh, I've been in New Brunswick uh, all the time, and um, I am doing clinical research for the past seven years. I'm the only dermatologist in Fredericton, and, and I see um, patients with psoriasis every day. We're going to move on to the next slide. Uh, my disclosures, I do clinical trials, so I've worked with a number of companies and uh, very grateful to all of our patients who participate um, in clinical research, uh, looking for new treatments for various skin conditions. We have about uh, 20 patients with psoriasis right now who are participating and uh, helping us find new treatments for psoriasis. Next slide. So what we will discuss today, we will uh, talk about psoriasis uh, causes severity and treatment options. We will um, discuss uh, the symptoms of psoriasis 
And um, what could you do? What can you share with your physician? Um, what treatments are available and uh, what to look out for? Next slide. So psoriasis is a very common condition. Uh, it affects about two to three percent of Canadians. Uh, it is equally common in men and women. And um, the plaque psoriasis, so psoriasis that we see on the scalp, elbows, knees, is the most common subtype. So this is something that uh, is the most common. Next slide. Psoriasis uh, carries a tremendous burden um, on our patients. Um, it is a really uh, suffering condition. It's chronic, the plaques are inflamed. It has tremendous impact on quality of life. It's something that is uh, with you, that you wear on your skin every day. Um, there are uh, associated conditions. Uh, there is arthritis, as Antonella mentioned, but also, you know, there's association with heart disease, with depression, and uh, th this all uh, really impacts the quality of life. Um, and there is this immense uh, on a daily uh, functioning. So anything that you do during the day, you have to take the clothing, you have to um, make sure that you know your elbows are covered or anything that you do, it's really with you day after day after day. Next slide. There is, um, be because of this huge impact, there's social exclusion. So many of our patients will um, they'll be covering themselves, but also isolate from people around them. So they will be shy, um, even in front of their family. We have patients who say, you know, I haven't hugged my, my children for, for years because they're, uh, they feel like they can't. Uh, they, the, the patients suffer from poor self-esteem. Uh, there's tremendous psychological distress. The condition makes you self-conscious, embarrassed. Uh, it is very frustrating. You feel helpless as well. Um, we've had uh, patients sharing the stories where, you know, they go to the store and, uh, as, you know, when they, when they try to serve the person, uh, the other person will say, oh, no, I don't want to, you know, I don't want to take anything from you. Um, some of our patients, there was one patient who was a cook and um, the um, uh, the uh, people in the restaurant, they wouldn't take any food that he would prepare and know that he has psoriasis. Um, this is um, just, you know, just horrible stories that we hear and uh, we take it to heart and we really try to help. Next slide. And uh, this is a little bit of um, hard uh, data that uh, really, um, speaks to daily experiences uh, of somebody living with psoriasis. So 58% of patients um, find difficulties with normal daily activities. Over 50% have difficulties with house, the yard work. About 50% have difficulties sleeping. So, and we know if you're not sleeping, you're not really functioning. Uh, there is reluctance to engage in social activities. Uh, personal, social relationships, so there's difficulty with sports. So over half of our uh, patients suffer with all this. Um, and this is important to mention to your physician. So there's particularly one aspect in your life that is really troublesome. Make sure that you mention uh, this because really this makes impact on our therapeutic decisions. Next slide. And just to emphasize again, and I'm, I'm sure that uh, people on the line, you, you live through this and you know this already. So not only there's social exclusion, uh, you have to, um, uh, you know, it impacts the sleep and the clothing choice and uh, social interaction, but it, there's also impact in the workplace. So there's loss of productivity. You have to run for blood work. You have to uh, go for phototherapy. Um, there is economic burden as well, buying the treatments. So they, there's often when we see a patient with psoriasis, you, the person will bring a bag of 10 different creams. Um, that's expensive. Uh, missing work for doctor's appointments is expensive. 
And it is not surprising that over 20% of uh, patients with psoriasis will have depression. Next slide. Now, is this a Nietzsche condition? So we, if we look in our textbooks from 20 years ago, um, the classic teaching was that psoriasis is not itchy, eczema is itchy. We know that this is not true anymore. Psoriasis can be extremely itchy. Um, and the degree is really different how, how itchy you are. It's different between the patients. So some patients say, well, it's somewhat itchy. Some patients says it's so itchy, they cannot sleep. It's like all day, they only think about, you know, scratching the, the plaque. Uh, and others say, well, it's not really bothering me. Uh, over 70% of patients find that it's the most frequent and the most bothersome symptoms for, for them. So please make sure that you tell the physician that uh, the itch is bothersome uh, because it's not necess necessarily wild, widely known and we need to address this itch. Next slide. Now, psoriasis uh, can be provoked by different factors. We know that there are three key components of the disease. So there is immune system dysregulation. So it doesn't mean that your immune system is low or it's malfunctioning. It is just overreactive, it attacks your skin. There's also genetic predisposition. Um, so we know that often psoriasis will run in the families. And um, there are some triggers. So let's talk about triggers. Next slide. So there are many triggers out there, and some of them are well known to you, and some of it perhaps is not very well known. So UV light can make psoriasis worse, but for some patients, about 10 to 15% of our patients, UV light actually makes them worse. So most of the time you will find that there's improvement in the summertime, but not always and not necessarily, so keep that in mind. We know that if you burn, if you have a sunburn, it actually can make psoriasis worse. So please be careful in the summertime, do not burn. Sleep, if you don't sleep, psoriasis gets worse. If you're stressed, psoriasis gets worse. And it is not uncommon for us to hear that, you know, there's a significant loss in the family or um, somebody's getting divorced and we know that psoriasis will get worse. Physical trauma to the skin, so if you, cut your skin, you may find that psoriasis goes into the area. This is well-described phenomenon, and uh, this is something that we look for when we examine the skin as well. Uh, exposure to certain medications may make psoriasis more. So some medications so that we use to treat uh, bipolar disorder, lupus, uh, high blood pressure may make psoriasis worse. So uh, this is something that we keep in mind when we see the patient with psoriasis. We look at the medications and see if there's anything that is not needed that we can stop and perhaps just that may improve psoriasis. Smoking may make psoriasis worse. Alcohol makes psoriasis worse. Um, strep infection, this is a very common trigger for flares of psoriasis. Uh, and in fact, there is one subtype of the psoriasis called gut teeth psoriasis, which generally would only happen with the preceding strep infection. Next slide. Now, when we see a patient with psoriasis, often um, after the exam, we determine, okay, is this mild psoriasis, is it moderate psoriasis or severe disease? And this will really, really will impact our treatment decision. Um, how do we make that decision? It's based most of the time on the body surface area. So one palm um, that, that you have, so it's, it's your palm, will be 1% of the body surface area. So mild disease usually is characterized by um, about three palms of psoriasis in your body. Moderate disease usually over 3%, so over three palms up to 9%, nine palms. And anybody who has more than 10 palms of psoriasis will have severe disease. And one palm may not seem like too much, but it can be quite significant, especially if it is itchy. Now, the exception to this uh, uh, gradient rule is where the psoriasis is located. So if psoriasis is on the face, if it is on the scalp, if it is in the genital area or affecting your nails, this may upgrade the severity of your disease. 
So we've had patients who have severe nail psoriasis. They have nothing anywhere else on their body, and they are considered to be as to have severe disease just because your nails are so bad. If somebody has psoriasis on the face or the genital area or the hands, let's say, so this really may impact their social, physical functioning, their work functioning as well. So this may upgrade to their, their disease to severe, even though the body surface area is only one to 2%. So make sure you tell your physician that you have the disease in those special areas so we can adequately um, define the severity of your condition. Next slide. And what treatment is right for you? It really depends on uh, each individual situation. So we look at the type of the psoriasis, but also severity. We'll look at the other medical conditions. For example, if somebody has psoriatic arthritis, this may, um, lead me to a different uh, option for treatment rather than if, you know, if the person does not have their arthritis. It really depends on your lifestyle. Um, we have many um, patients who travel um, to um, Florida or to warm places in the winter time. So we know that, you know, they're gone for six months of the year. So I need to think of a treatment that will work while they are away. Um, what about the um, risks and benefits of treatment? So each treatment has pros and cons. So depending on uh, your disease, um, other medical conditions, we may choose to balance those risks and benefits. Um, age may make a role. Uh, general health, uh, whether you're in good health or you have many medical conditions that we need to consider. Are there any allergies? Um, preferences as well. So some patients prefer to use topical treatments. Others will say, I will not be using another cream ever. I've tried many different ones and this is not something that I want to do. So that's all right. So we have other options. Um, if you're pregnant or you may become pregnant, uh, this may uh, alter the choices of treatment that we have. Uh, so you need to talk to your doctor and talk about other medical conditions that you have. Uh, certain lifestyle factors, do travel, um, what you do for work may play an impact on the treatment decisions as well. Your preferences are important as well. Uh, so make sure to discuss it with the physician. Next slide. And mild to moderate disease most of the time will be treated with topical treatment phototherapy or systemic treatment. So when we say systemic treatment, we less um, of think of the um, oral medication. So like methotrexate or serotonin, and we'll touch on this a little bit further down. Um, we often will combine the treatments as well. So what, what we call a combination therapy. So many of our patients will have a cream or a lotion that we will combine with light treatment. Sometimes we'll combine topical treatments with systemic medications, and sometimes we'll actually combine them all. Next slide. So the topical treatment means something that you apply on the skin. So it will be either a cream or an ointment or a lotion. Um, some of them are over the counter. Uh, some of them are prescription. Um, so there are some pluses and minuses for the topical treatments. So these treatments usually will take time, especially if you have a large body surface area. Um, you have to like your topical treatment. So some patients will prefer cream, some patients prefer an ointment. So when ointments are like Vaseline, they're greasy creams so will, will be white and they rub, rub in into the skin a little bit better. It also depends where your psoriasis is. So if your psoriasis is on the scalp, it will be really uh, hard to use uh, a greasy ointment and then wash it off in the morning. So we may prefer to use a lotion. So make sure that you show all the areas to the treating physician so we know which topical treatment we would like to pick, but also make sure that you indicate the preference for a topical treatment if you have one. Next slide. And there are different subclasses of the topical treatments that we have. So some of you might have uh, tried 
TARS. So TARS uh, come as the topical solutions or gels, and they also come as shampoos. Um, so there are many, if you go on in the pharmacy, there are many on the shelves. So there's TAR, uh, um, Neutrogena TAR gel, Security shampoo, many out there that will have tar. Tar has particular smell to it. That's how we often recognize it. It also has kind of browny color. Um, it can be a messy treatment. Uh, it can stain clothing if it's applied topically um, in a cream. Um, so this is something to keep in mind. Uh, however, what how it works is that tars will decrease um, uh, division of the rapidly growing cells. So psoriasis will divide more rapidly than the normal skin, and this is how it works. So it will reduce inflammation and it will reduce the itch and the scaling. Now we have some medicines that are called vitamin D analogs. So these are uh, ointments uh, that uh, will be um, will have a, a vitamin D um, as an active ingredient. Um, and what it does, it slows down the skin cell growth and it flattens the lesions and removes the scales. It works well um, as a maintenance treatment, but the plaques are very acute and severe. Sometimes it doesn't work as well, uh, but this is something that can be quite nice addition to other topical treatments, but also can be used alone. Uh, topical retinoids, um, so there's something called Tazaratin or Tazarac uh, cream or gel, not used uh, quite often uh, anymore. It can be quite irritating, but sometimes we'll still use it, especially on the palms and soles. And uh, the way this works, it uh, slows down the uh, growth of the skin cells and reduces the inflammation. The most commonly prescribed class of the medications are topical steroids. So they reduce inflammation, they decrease the swelling, the redness, they slow down the growth of the skin cells and all the inflammatory factors in the skin. They can be effective uh, during the acute flares. We usually don't use them uh, for as a maintenance treatment forever long term, but they can be used on and off and quite effectively. And uh, we often will use combination therapy. So we will combine, let's say, tar and the corticosteroid cream. Uh, we can combine salicylic acid. It will peel the scale and also corticosteroid to reduce the inflammation. And also the vitamin D analog and corticosteroid. Um, the nice thing about combination therapy is they combine the advantages of using two treatments at once. They maximize the efficacy and minimize the side effects. Um, Many of them will be easy to use and um, they can be used once a day as opposed to uh, some other treatments that will be used twice a day. Next slide. And uh, topical treatments are used uh, by all of our patients. So whether you have mild, moderate or severe disease, if you still have plaques or psoriasis, this is something that we reach out for all the time. Next slide. Phototherapy is also commonly used. So um, uh, we um, there are two forms of phototherapy. So there's UVA and UVB. UVA is often will be combined with sorolin. Um, it starts with the P, so we could call it PUA. And what sorolin does, it makes your plaques more sensitive to the UV light. So often will be combined with the UVA treatment to make the treatment more effective. Um, so phototherapy will require a little bit of a commitment. It's the treatments are usually done three times a week for 12 weeks or more. Um, so if you have a busy family work life, uh, it's sometimes very difficult to get to the office. Also, if you leave an hour or two hours, or so some of our patients travel four hours to see us, it's impossible for them to attend the phototherapy. So uh, mention it to the treating physician um, if you have any concerns or constraints. Next slide. We often get asked, what about home phototherapy? Could this be done at home? Yes, it can. There are pros and cons as with everything. Um, so for the home phototherapy, it's convenient. It's something that you could do at home at your uh, kind of own time. Uh, the disadvantages, you have to obtain your own unit. Um, they can be expensive. Um, you need to um, 
study a little bit and educate yourself on how to use the treatment um, about the machine that you're getting. Um, there's a protocol that you follow. So it requires a little bit of homework and downtime, but once you master it, you can certainly do it. Um, there are still risks with the home phototherapy, same as with office treatment. So there's potential risk of burns. So there could be blisters. There could be color changes of the skin, redness. Um, phototherapy can cause premature aging of the skin. Skin cancer is a rare problem, especially with, U with the UVB treatment, uh, more so common with PUVA treatment that is not used so, so often anymore. So there are pros and cons. The well-known distributors in Canada, there's Zavlin and Solark. Um, if you go on the website, you can obtain the information, but I will urge you to talk to the treating physician first. And I always advise our patients to try it in the office first. So before you invest into the equipment that may not work for you, you wanna, you know, you wanna know that it will work. So maybe try to attend the office treatments, make sure that they agree with you, that they work before you consider the home for the therapy. Next slide. When you do the home phototherapy, you still have to protect your eyes. Um, you have to protect the sensitive areas as well. Um, you start low and you gradually increase the dose. You still have to be careful with the sun because sun is also UV light. Uh, if you add two together, you can burn. Um, there's a full, uh, protocol that you would follow and this often will be provided with the machine, but sometimes you still have to kind of uh, uh, device your own treatment regimen. Uh, you will know when to reduce the dose. So if you miss some treatments, if you're gone for a week, you usually will keep the dose the same. If you were gone for up to two weeks, you decrease it by 25%. Uh, if you didn't attend the treatments for two to three weeks, usually we decrease the dose by 50%. And if it's more than four weeks, you start again, start fresh. If you take a new medication, they can be photosensitizing, so you have to be careful that you don't burn. You may have to reduce the dose. And you still have to see a physician. We recommend that uh, patients who do home phototherapy still be seen every six to 12 months. Next slide. Now, oral medications, so the most commonly prescribed would be methotrexate acetretin or uh, the brand name Sorietine. Cyclosporin is not used so often anymore, but it, it is still used um, um, in certain areas. And the Premalast or Tesla is one of the newer additions uh, to the treatment. Um, the oral medications work differently. So methotrexate um, is a form of chemotherapy. It was um, introduced as chemotherapy many years ago. It does suppress your immune system, though we, the doses that we use for psoriasis usually, usually are not high, so the suppression of the immune system is not very high. Uh, and they really stop that inflammatory response leading to the flares. Acetretin is completely different. It's actually a form of vitamin A. It does slow the growth and the division of the skin cells and reduces the inflammation. It does not work for psoriatic arthritis, whereas methotrexate helps the arthritis. However, acetretin is not immunosuppressant, so it can be used in the scenarios where immune suppression is not desirable. Cyclosporin is a big gun of psoriasis treatment. It is immunosuppressive medication that is used in transplant patients. So this is something that we take seriously. It can be quite immunosuppressive. Uh, it has many different side effects. Though it can be tolerated well, there is blood work that has to be monitored. So this is something that we use with great caution and usually we don't use it long term. Uh, Premalast um, is the new addition to the family of uh, the oral medications. It is not immunosuppressant, it's immunomodulatory uh, medication, so it doesn't suppress the immune system, but rather regulates it. It reduces the inflammation in the skin and joints and can be quite helpful to control the disease. Next slide. And most of the time we do use the combination therapy. So we combine different topicals, we combine topical treatment with light treatment, topical treatment with systemic treatment, and sometimes all of the different options. Next slide. 
Now, what can you do uh, to manage the itch? So often when we control the psoriasis, the itch will be controlled as well. Scratching and rubbing can aggravate the itch. So what you want to do, you want to apply cold pack to the area. Or what you can also do is you can use your prescription cream or moisturizer in the fridge. So when you apply it cold, it helps with the itch. Wearing loose clothing, uh, avoiding synthetic fabrics may help as well. And stress makes the itch worse. So control your stress levels if you can. Next slide. Now, what do you do when treatment is not working? This is a common problem for all of us. So what we hear is, you know, I had to use my cream for a week and it's not working. Well, it takes more than a week, right? Uh, we hear the story where psoriasis returns when you stop the treatment. Well, there is no cure for psoriasis, so psoriasis is likely to recur if you stop the treatment. The other complaint that we hear is that the prescription ran out, yeah, I stopped the treatment, my psoriasis is worse than ever. Yes, yeah, so please check your prescription. On the bottle, often you will see the number of refills, so make sure that you still have refills, and if you don't, book an appointment with your doctor and get the repeat. And then, you know, we sometimes will hear, I forget to take my pills, my treatment is not working. Well, if you forget, put some reminders, put the, you can put them on your phone, put your medication, but the toothbrush or hairbrush and try to remember it. Next slide. And prescription will not work if you will not try it. So um, we know that 50% of our patients will never uh, get the, our prescriptions to the pharmacy. So it's really hard to help someone when the prescription um, when, when the prescription is not even filled. Next slide. So when the treatment is not working, have you filled your prescription? Have you tried it? Clarify with your doctor if you followed instructions as prescribed. Sometimes miscommunication does a cure. Um, tell your doctor if you don't like your prescription. So if you have to use something that you don't like, you're not going to use it. So if you hate creams, let's try the pills. If you don't like the lotion, if it's too greasy, let's get you something that's not greasy. Tell your doctor if the medication does not agree with you. We know that you know not every medication is for everyone. So don't be shy to tell us if you don't feel well on some treatment. And tell your doctor if you can commit to a treatment. You can say, well, I can't do phototherapy. I can't get time out of work. Can I do something else? Next slide. So be informed about your treatment. Uh, use information to communicate with your doctor. Have realistic expectations. So try your treatments. So if you can try them, if you have reservations, discuss it with your doctor. Remember, psoriasis will be present all your life. So there's no cure, but it can be controlled. And don't assume that there's nothing else for you. Um, we have many treatment options and we can certainly help you if you're willing to get this help. Next slide. There are great Canadian resources. So there's Canadian Psoriasis Network, there is Canadian Association for Psoriasis Patients and uh, Living Well with Psoriasis. So make sure you, you check them out. Next slide. Now, lifestyle considerations are important. Stress makes your psoriasis worse. worse uh, weight, if you're overweight, you may find that your disease is worse. If you lose weight, it may improve. Uh, smoking, hard to quit, but this is something that will affect and uh, bother your psoriasis. If uh, you tend to overconsume alcohol, this can be an issue. Uh, and high cholesterol can also affect the psoriasis. Next slide. Now, what are the questions that you can ask your dermatologist? So what kind of psoriasis do you have? Do you have flax psoriasis? Do you have other kind? A any information that could be shared? Uh, what treatment options are available? Make sure that you know all the options and you are able to help your physician to pick the option that's right for you. When you start the treatment, know how long it will take before you see the results, you see the changes. What side effects or benefits should I watch out for? And what can you do better to manage your psoriasis? Next slide. 
And when should you see a dermatologist? Well, when psoriasis significantly affects your quality of life. So if you know that there's something that you'd like to do and psoriasis stops you, you definitely should see a specialist to help you out. When the itch is not controlled, we know that when you're itchy, you cannot function, you cannot sleep. So um, it is important to uh, get the itch under control. If you're not satisfied with your current treatment, so you know that you, you, the treatment is not working, you can't tolerate it, um, you don't like it, so let's change it, let's do something different. Next slide. And do contact your doctor um, if um, you know you, you your treatment is stop is not working anymore. Uh, think of the triggers. Um, if all of a sudden the treatment stops working, maybe you have a strep infection. Maybe there's more stress than usual. Did you start a new medication? Uh, is your treatment expired? We commonly see patients who bring cream that they failed five years ago. Well, it's probably not going to work as well. Well, maybe it's not psoriasis. Sometimes we'll see um, nails that kind of look like psoriasis, but then it's actually a fungal infection. Um, and sometimes the disease gets naturally worse and the treatment needs to be upgraded. We need to do something different. Next slide. So sometimes we also have the treatment. So you get used to the treatment, the body kind of says, okay, I'm done with this. So we stop it, we change it to something else, and then we can actually go back to, to the original treatment and it starts working again. And your specialist may switch uh, to other treatment options, right? Date back and there's different things that we can do. Next slide. Can psoriasis be cured? No, there's no cure, but we can control the disease. Um, there are remissions, so there is no visible disease during the remission. So um, you feel like psoriasis is not there, but often it will recur with time. And occasionally we know that psoriasis burns out. So sometimes the disease goes away. It is rare, but it does happen. Next slide. And there's always hope. You're not alone. There are many uh, psoriasis patients out there. Do join Canadian Psoriasis Network. Learn about psoriasis and treatment options. Talk to your doctor about psoriasis. And if you're not getting the answers, Make sure that you find a doctor who can give you the answers. There are over 700 of dermatologists in Canada. We are well trained on psoriasis diagnosis and treatment. So look for a Canadian certified dermatologist to help you. And there are 99 clinical trials that are currently registered in Canada investigating new psoriasis treatments. So if you really determine to um, really bring new patients um, on the horizon. So volunteer for the clinical trials. Sometimes these are great uh, opportunities to try the new treatment and stay on the treatment that works. And that's it for me. Um, so I'm gonna hand over to uh, Antonella and uh, we'll you. take some questions. Thank you so much, Dr. Turchin. I that was a tremendous uh, amount of, of really useful information. And I say that knowing, um, you know, these are the types of questions that we often get here uh, at CPN. So thank you so much. And, and I just, um, before turning it over to questions, want to mention that um, in terms of some of the things that you brought up with um, some of the challenges with navigating the healthcare system, but getting even getting a diagnosis can be uh, extremely challenging for some people. Um, and you know, knowing what to do uh, while you're managing your condition can be challenging. So um, we have uh, launched some new portals on our website um, today, actually on World Psoriasis Day, uh, that talks about some of those things. I, I think one of the big things you said is, um, you know, 50% of people will never get their prescription filled, um, but we know they took that first step to uh, try to get some help. So um, some of the information on, 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 on our site um, talks about that and, and, and uh, dives a little bit deeper into things like access and, and uh, um, where to go and what to do if you need more help or information. So thank you for capturing all of that. Um, 
before we do have a couple of minutes uh, before we have to wrap up i don't see any questions in the chat right now if, if anyone uh, does have any questions um for laura or sandra or dr turgeon um before we wrap up tonight that's great if any occur to you um after our session please feel free to write in to um to us at uh, connect with us through our website or through Facebook or Twitter is, uh, is up on your screen. I have a very quick question if, if um, Dr. Turgeon and, and maybe even for Laura who mentioned this in her talk, um, we often get asked about psoriatic arthritis and the risk factors there. I just want to ask you if, if you can shed any uh, light on the question of is this something that can also affect people with milder forms uh, or severity? Uh, Dr. Turchin? Thank you for this question. I didn't really touch on this uh, during my presentation, but it's a very important question. Um, so patients with mild to moderate psoriasis are just as prone to have psoriatic arthritis. So in general, a third of our patients will have psoriatic arthritis. So if you, um, somebody who, ha who is stiff in the morning and the stiffness will last over an hour, this is a sign of psoriatic arthritis potentially. Uh, if you have joint pain, um, that potentially you may have psoriatic arthritis. If you have pain in your heel or on the side of your elbow, this could be another sign of psoriatic arthritis. So make sure that you bring it to your physician because sometimes it's not something that will come out. It takes a little bit of time to uh, get this out and um, pay attention to this. So make sure you bring it on so we can actually use the treatments that can work for both psoriasis and psoriatic arthritis. Thank you so much. And uh, I appreciate your, your input because, um, you know, it is something that, that we hear a lot about. So, so always helping people to make that connection. So we, we only have a couple of minutes left and uh, I will, um, start to wrap it up by thanking everybody uh, who joined the call this evening um, for making the time um, and, and hopefully there, there are pieces that you picked up on um, that you hadn't heard before. Um, again, there, there is, this will be uh, posted on our, for viewing on our website and on our YouTube channel and it will be transcribed into French so that it's there um, to access um, when needed. And if you do have any other questions, I invite you to please connect with us. Um, I want to thank very much uh, Laura and Sandra and Dr. Turgeon again for your expertise and for your time. And thank you to Natalie Richardson for your uh, technical support. Um, I want to remind people to, um, if you're not already a member of CPN, we invite you to sign up on our website. Uh, it's up on the website or up on the screen now. Membership is free and it allows you to keep updated on what's happening in the psoriasis landscape in Canada to keep informed about events like these um, and, and others in your community and to become involved if you're interested in opportunities to build awareness. So with that, I will thank you again uh, for your time and, uh, and we can uh, end the session for tonight. Thank you. Thank you.